Okay, we are gonna try this again. One second. Okay. Oh my gosh, so much better. You can hear me now? I can hear you. It doesn't sound awesome. like you're trapped in a, what's it called? You don't sound like you're trapped in a car wash. You sounded like you were trapped in a car wash before. Oh no. So, basically. Can you see, can you see me now? Am I the right way? You're not the right way. No. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's terrible. Not that you're not the right way, but you're not, um. <laughs> Now you're completely upside down. This is why now? I need a producer. What? Now it's perfect. Now? now it is perfect. It's okay. crazy. It's, it's, it's 2019. You'd think they'd figure that out by now. You would think they'd figure it out. And I'm almost upset that Facebook will not allow you to use your computer with Facebook Live, which is really, really stupid. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so as... Those of you who don't know, I have been in and out of podcasting. We'll keep it, we'll just give a, back, a, a brief backpedaling. I've been in and out of podcasting for about, gosh, how old am I now? Six years. And this is basically to pick up where I left off around Hanukkah time um, with my show, Hopefully Spreading Wisdom. And the whole point of this show is to take the connections, the people that I am, I feel fortunate to know that I've met, the lessons that they've taught me, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and frankly, all the bullshit in between, and say, like, what can we do to invoke change, to empower people, and to bring about, frankly, a better earth um, mm. and a better situation now? Before we get into the topic of today, I wanted to just open with a passage from my favorite prophet, the book of Yehoshkel, Ezekiel, my favorite prophet. And this speaks to me on so many levels because I feel like for anybody who is spiritually in tuned, I see this happening now and I see this happening as a result of our where where our leadership is failing and where our leadership is thriving i feel like we're seeing these prophecies unfold and there is a danger that affects every man woman and child that we're going to discuss today and in my humble opinion being no rabbi being no Torah scholar, just being a person who thinks and a person who believes in God with unquestionable faith. I, I thought you were a rabbi for a second. I think that this evil that affects all humanity is mentioned, and I am going to open with this before we get into it. And it is, this is in the art scroll version of the actual text of, of Yehezkel. He said to me, did you see Ben Adam? It is too trivial to the family of Judah to prevent their doing the abomination that they have committed here, that they have filled the land with injustice. And yet, excuse me, and they yet return to, they yet return to anger me. See them. They hurl their shame in their own face. I, too, will react with fury. My eyes will not spare nor pity. They will cry in my ears with loud voice, yet I will not hear them. He called into my ear with a loud voice, saying, Bring near those appointed over the city, each with his weapon of destruction in hand. Wow. Today we are talking about what is the sickness, the wicked, the evil that is pedophilia and the threat that pedophilia has on all of humanity at a time when we are so divided over 
this one believes in this, this one believes in that, we should be coming together to deal with a problem that is not prejudice, that takes no hostages and no prisoners. Basically, this evil, the evil that is pedophilia, doesn't care if you're rabbi such and such a son, and um, it's a threat. And I wanted to invite my friend Baruch on today to share with us his experiences as a survivor of this evil and things that happened and in the place in which they happened is a place that a person is supposed to feel at most one with themselves and that is their yeshiva or their school. Why don't we get into it, Baruch? Tell us about you. Why are we here? Why does this matter so much? And um, tell us about you. Go ahead. Um, so you actually, you, you contacted me a while ago, um, about this and, uh, I feel like it's, it's, it's something that I've always been wanting to do, mm -hmm. um, to, I mean, everyone obviously wants to raise awareness, but at the same time, I think, um, I think r raising awareness can be one of two things. I think raising awareness can either state a story or say, you know, A, B, and C, and that's the reason why, or raising awareness can be an actual person speaking about his own, his right. own life and his own story. Um, so it, I mean, it's something I've always wanted to do because it's something that I went through and, you know, at the same time, like when you go through something like that, you can't change it and you can't go back in time and change what happened to you. But I think the one thing that, you know, would comfort someone like me that has already been through it would be to try and raise awareness about it and try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, because it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be someone's life to have to, you know, build them back up from, from the bottom as a kid, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, you know, it, things happen in life and, you know, things are, you know, unfortunately life is tough, but it shouldn't start from an age with me, like, let's say 10 years old, you know what I mean? It shouldn't start at that age. It should start when you're already developed and you develop skills to deal with hardship, you know, because right. if, if that's been the case since you were a little kid that you didn't get that opportunity to grow. So you have to grow within two minutes because if you're, right. if you're going to go through something like that, you need to gather the strength not that you've built over years, you need to gather the strength from that minute on because you're in your childhood. So there's no, right. there's no, um, there's no part of you that has the tools because, because, you know, oh, this is just a part of life. And, you know, it's not a part of life. It shouldn't be it's a part of life. It's not a part of life. No, and it's it, not. You're right. And even if it is a part of life, then it shouldn't be a part of life at that, at that point in your life. Um, so, yeah, when you when you spoke to me about it and you spoke to me about the possibility of doing this, um, it really um, it opened my eyes and it it really um, it's really something that I want to do because I think first of all it'll help other people and at the same time, in a selfish way, I think it'll bring me comfort as well. I, I don't think that's selfish at all. I think that it's um, if anything, you have been through the worst brand of hell and evil that a human can experience in my humble opinion in the physical world and i am just so grateful that you feel comfortable in sharing this because that is really the only way we are going to wake these people up is to how serious this is is to keep doing this and i hate to say it throwing it back in our in, in their faces because the reality you like my ex-husband were sexually assaulted in the yeshiva system for god's sake a yeah. place that hell hath no fury should someone raise a hand to one of my boys i will kill your bloodline i'm sorry mm. and no, it's, this it's is true. The attitude we need to have we need to know the shit that goes on in these yeshivas and we need them to know under no uncertain terms that we are here to make sure 
that this remains changed. Why are the Jewish people not out of Gullis yet? Simple. We haven't had leadership willing to fight evil, on the, uh, fight dirty. When, when mm. dirt, evil fights us dirty every day, whether it's the Yetzirah to smoke, whether it's the Yetzirah to drink alcohol, to fornicate, whatever the case may be, we seem to be on top of it. But it wasn't until the miraculous birth of the Jewish Community Watch that we had people actively getting in and saying, we will not accept sexual yeah. abuse, period. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, I actually, I, I wrote uh, an article for, for, for the organization. I, I, I think, you know, it, as, a, as someone that, that, drew up, that, that, that grew up, you know, ultra-Orthodox and religious and all that, when you open your eyes and you actually go on the site, and, you know, they have this thing called, I'm sure you know, the wall of shame. Um, and when you look at it, it's just, it's, it's so crazy when you, when you just look at it and it just goes on and on and on. And the crazy thing is that 75% of the people have the big beards, you know what I mean? And it's, right. it's, um, it's a scary thing to see, you know, uh, like, you know, for example, like me, I, I, I actually, I, I have a son and, and to see, to see something like that, you know, going on in the world, it's a, it's a scary thing to come to grips with. It's a scary thing to, to think about, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, especially me having, having gone through something like that, if right. someone were to put a hand on my, on my child, you know, I, I wouldn't care if, if I went to prison for I the rest of my their life. Bloodline. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. You know, and, and and the crazy thing is that if someone did something, I'm sure that they would, you know, uh, land land in prison, um, which is kind of crazy because we hope. because we hope. yeah because we hope we don't know that we don't know that they'll go to prison. Yeah, no, no, I'm I'm saying that if someone if someone does something to the pedophile, then the person that did that thing to the pedophile would go to prison because. Right. Oh, he assaulted me and, and yada, yada. And he, you know, he did all these things. But at the same time, if you think about it, giving punishment to someone like that, that's defending a child. People don't realize that when someone does that to a child, that is murder. You know what I mean? That um, the, the pain that you live with every day, the thoughts, the memories, the, the, the triggers, the, the PTSD, the nightmares, the, the night terrors, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a living sentence, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a sentence to your, to your mind, to, to your body, to, to everything. Every day when you walk around, the abusers are right there. You know right. what I mean? And I don't think people, I think some people misunderstand that, that, you know, people think that, okay, it happens and, and you know, and, and you work through it and, and, you know, and that's it, you move on. But, but at the right. same time, I don't think people realize that they always have a grip on you because right. what they do is they take you when you're a child and they flip your brain because you don't even know what's going on at that. I mean, for me personally, I, I didn't even know what he was doing. I didn't even know what it right. meant. Right. And so it completely you know, changed my brain cycle because I, I didn't know what was going on and I had to adapt really quickly. So, so that's, so, that's so interesting. I mentioned in the video last night and it, after I post, I post this to Facebook and, you know, put all the hashtags and whatever, what is interesting that I read recently is that, that you look at the brain scan of a sex abuse victim as opposed to a person who has never been sexually assaulted that person I'm sorry are we there are we back I can I can hear you but you're you're frozen Okay how about now can you hear me I I I can hear Okay so that person that has never been sexually assaulted their brain scans actually look different than of a person who has who has been sexually assaulted. Yeah, I, I, that, that, it, it makes it makes total sense because 
the amount of information that's being processed in, for example, in my brain is constant. It, it's, uh, it, it keeps on it, it, it. And I don't know if you've heard, but a lot of times people that have been abused, they develop their own story because yeah. there's, it's so much to handle that the brain almost creates its own wave. It creates its own story. It creates its own life. And it just, it eats at you and it eats at you and it eats at you constantly every day. And, you know, yeah, you can work on it and, and, you know, you can change things and you can, you know, work on this and work on that. But at the same time, it's always there. You know what I mean? At the same time, when you, when you put your head on the pillow at night, that's what's there. You know, right. I mean, like when you're alone with your thoughts, when you're alone with your brain, that's there. It's always there. Hmm. So tell us about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Um, I, I, um, I grew happen? up, um, I grew up in, in Borough Park, which is a, a ultra religious neighborhood and, and uh, you know, uh, a, a place that's very um, confined. It's a bubble. It's a, you know, it's, everyone's the same. You know, you dress the same, you go to the same schools, you go, you know, to the same synagogues, to everything. And um, so, you know, I, I pretty much, I grew up the same way. I grew up with, you know, going to yeshiva and, and, and you know, just being, just being with the same people as me. And um, I mean, for, for the most part of, of my childhood, everything was fine. Well, not for the most. Well, not for the most part, but um, up until about I was ten, and um, you know, it, it's it's interesting the way things start because the way I, I find that a lot of times the way abuse starts is through kindness, you know. Right. Really. Um, yeah. So you know, I, I would I was very into sports. I was very I loved sports. I love I love I love basketball. I love uh, dodgeball. You know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, so pretty much the way it goes in, in, in yeshiva is there is no, you know, there, there is no like, oh, college and stuff like that. It's pretty much. You'll, and you there have, is no sexual education, by the way. I think that's important no. to mention. No, there, there is, is no, there, no sex ed. There is no, no boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. There is none of that, correct? Yeah, it, it's the. They, no they, awareness. Yeah, what, what, what they pretty much do is they take the science book that are supposed to have things like that and they go to the reproduction part and they, they rip it out. And really? um, yeah, they rip it out of the books and they go to, let's say, children's books and stuff like that. And any picture of a female, they black out with a marker, you know, wow. to, to, keep, to keep the person away from it until they get married. And I mean, by the time they get married, they have no idea what they're getting themselves into, but that's a whole other story. Right. Um, so pretty much, you know, you have this school where there's no college. So everyone is just there. You have from like, from first grade all the way up till, till 12th grade. And then even past 12th grade, because, you know, the school that I was at, San Sofer, it was, it, it's adjacent to each other. So everyone eats in the same place and you have, you know, 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds. Let me get this straight. So you have 10-year-olds and you have 15-year-olds eating in the same lunchroom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. And, and, and the school administration doesn't find that grossly inappropriate. I guess not. No, mm -hmm. they don't. They just, uh, I mean, I, I guess to them, it's just a part of life. I guess to them, they're, they're so used to doing things their way that, you know, that's just the way that they're going to do it. And you have, you know, it, it's kind of, it's all just a mix. It's all just like throwing things in, you know, like ripping this out, putting this in, taking this out, putting this in. It's all, it's all a fabricated lie surrounding around the part of fearing God. So anything else is just thrown out the window pretty much, okay. uh, you know, and, and, and I don't really want to get into religion because I know there's mm -hmm. people, you know, that, you know, have different opinions about religion and stuff like that. But 
I guess that's a whole other topic. But um, so yeah, I mean they have they have all the people there, and and when it comes to sports, a lot of times you'll have let's say the ten year olds in the same sports room as a twenty year old. And um, what are twenty year olds doing in the yeshiva? Um, so pretty much in when, when you're in yeshiva, you just keep on staying in yeshiva till for the whole till you get married. So there is no there's no college or anything like that or uh, education. You just study Torah for your whole life, pretty much. That's all they do. Um, so we're all learning Torah, so they just dump them all in the same place um, because there's no like education or anything like that. It's just it just is what it is. Um, but you know, so you have so what what I was going through at that point was, um, you know, I'm the youngest of nine and, mm-hmm. you know, not to, to put anyone down or anything like that, but, you know, I was kind of left alone, you know, I was kind of like a loner and, and, uh, you know, I had hand-me-downs and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I was just, you know, I wasn't and like, most I, children. right. Yeah. You know, I wasn't really like popular or anything like that. And I had, uh, you know, I was bullied a lot, um, because of my skin and, and, you know, just different things that I was bullied about. Um, so pretty much what this older, you know, guy saw was that I was weak, you know, I I was vulnerable because I didn't, I didn't have anything. I didn't have anyone. I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have anything going for me at that point. Right. Um, so what he did was pretty much he, he got friendly with me, you know, he started standing up for me. He started, um, you know, let's say for playing sports, he'll like, you know, do things for me and, and, you know, make me feel good and make me feel, you know, like I mattered. Um, right. And um, so, so pretty much, you know, to me, it was like, I have a friend, you know what I mean? Like someone actually cares about me, you know, yeah. like I'm going to, I'm going to grab this, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Um, and then, and that's how, that, that's how he got to me. Um, so what was the age difference between you and this, and this boy that you're speaking of? Um, it was about uh, nine to ten years. So you were at this point ten years old. Yeah, I was about ten, eleven, and he was like twenty, nineteen, twenty. And so he was twenty. Yeah. And no principal had any problem with exposing someone else's nine-year-old to no. twenty-year-old. No, it, it happens all the time. It happens daily, multiple times daily. Yeah. No issues there. And is this school still in function? Oh, yeah. It's one of the biggest schools here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's and a are, very... are they aware of your allegations? Are they aware of who you are and the things that have gone on? Um, they're aware of it, um, but they deny it until this day. That's part, of, that's part of the fucked up story. It's part of... Uh, you know, that's like the aftermath of what happened, you know, mm-hmm. that, that that's kind of what led me on to this, um, you know, five year dread of of abuse, you know what I mean? Because it, it pretty much it started from there and it was ignored. And, uh, you know, as a person, when you're shut down and, you know, when you speak for yourself and no one does anything, you don't say anything the second time, because if I was shut down, then why would I say something now? You know, what I mean, My nothing's going to change. Had a similar... My ex-husband um, shared a similar story with me that one of the one of the individuals who sexually assaulted him was accused by another boy, I think around the, the 14 age range. And the other boy was not only shut down, but when it had come to the pivotal mo- the, the, the pivotal point where it was very clear to all parties involved, that it was very clear to all parties involved that um, something sexual had taken place, you know, consensual or otherwise, between the, the student and the teacher. They then spun it that the boy was responsible for seducing the grown ass man, the grown ass pedophile. Married, married to a woman, so they they took it into a perspective that this fourteen year old boy 
seduced this married man who sexually assaulted him. So there wasn't even the step back and saying, oh God, we got to alert the police. We got to do this. We got to do that. And that made my ex-husband see, well, if, if they're going to accuse this one of being, you know, seducing him, what are they going to say about me? And he immediately shut down. And that was at a time when he was actually considering going forward because someone else had come forward. Yeah. Um, they, <laughs> like, do you think this is systematically planned that way? Oh, like, 100%. 100, 100%. It, it's, it's very, very carefully planned because if you think about it, you know, what, one of the things that they claimed when I was going through this and when I actually came forward was that I was, I was seeking attention. So I, I told them what happened and all this because I was seeking attention. Right. It, and if you, if you think about it, growing up the way I grew so you up. you did go forward. You did tell administration. Yeah. After the first you, time, yeah. You told them what? Um, so, so pretty much what happened was after the first time, you know, I was abused, um, you know, I went over to someone and I told them what happened, not really knowing that it was bad. You know, I was just kind of, you know, it was just something that was on my mind. So I just told him right. and, 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 you know, he looks at me and he says, you know, you, you gotta, you have to tell, you know, the principal. And th this is the fucked up part about it is that I didn't even want to go because I didn't even know what was going on because I was so young. I didn't know what it was. So I didn't understand, like, why would he want me to tell the principal? Like, there's nothing wrong with it. You know what I mean? Right. Because pretty much what he did was he instilled in my mind that something like that is normal. That's how you live life. That's how, that's how life is meant to be. It's that if you, if you do things for other people, then they'll care for you and they'll love you. So in my head, what he had planted in my head was drop your pants and I'll love you. Okay. And, um, so the crazy part now, is did that. Did you speak to your parents before you spoke to the principal of the school? Were your um, parents notified prior to that? They, they weren't notified prior. I, I went to this school first um, and then my parents found out about it because okay. um, pretty much, you know, what, what happened was um, – after it happened. So like I told you, I, I went to this guy and he told me to, to tell them. And, and so pretty much I went to the principal, I told him the whole story. And, and, you know, after I told him the whole story, they, they kind of went on like high alert for some reason, you know, like asking me all these questions and like, did this happen? Did that happen? Like, are you sure it happened? And, and, and maybe you were just, you know, thinking about, and I'm like, I, I, I don't know what it is. But, right. this but this happened. Um, and pretty much after, after I told them, what they did was they, um, they created a whole fuss about it, which actually caused the whole school to find out about it. That, because they did that and the whole school found out about it, what happened after that point is that I got a target on my head. Because now people know that I was abused. So anyone that would want to do something like that would come straight to me because they knew in their head that this happened to me. So he's obviously an easy target. Um, but pretty much after they did that, you know, the whole school found out. And um, what they decided to do was they called my parents. And they told my parents that, first of all, it's not true. And second of all, even if so it the is true, tells the par your parents that you lied, basically. Yeah, yeah. They said, "Oh, you know, okay. he's he wants attention, this and that, and, and you know, don't do anything about it." And nothing happened. And even if it did happen, still don't do anything about it. He'll get over it. Um. So. The, the thing is, th this is the tricky part for me, you know, regarding parents and family and stuff like that. You know, I don't, I don't really like speaking down about it. But at the same time, you know, you, you can't blame someone that follows someone so blindly. You know what I mean? You can't blame someone that follows a rabbi so blindly, you know, and, and due to that, you know, they were called and they were told not to do anything about it. And they listened because it's a rabbi. 
You know what I mean? And, and that's what people are used to. And that's why people look at me as such a, a rebel because I ask questions. I don't follow faith blindly. I don't follow um, people that lead in a, in a, like, in a way of fear. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? Um, so pretty much, you know, they didn't believe it happened. And actually at one point, uh, I remember the principal coming over to me and bringing me to the synagogue and he wanted me to, to swear in front of the Torah. He wanted me to, you know, swear to God that it happened. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, there's nothing much else to say other than I didn't, at that point, I didn't even know what was going on. You know, I, I was so oblivious to everything. You know, it just became this crazy thing. And then, and then, you know, since everyone found out about it, that's what started, you know, the next five years of abuse. So this then happened. Do you think, and we'll, we're, we're going to wrap up in a minute, but this is only the first of what I am hoping to be two or three interviews with you, Barack, so we mm-hmm. can really get a very clear picture as we approach the season of Pesach, where mm-hmm. we're all supposed to be doing things to leave Egypt. And I think one part of Goshen that we are very comfortable in, in a suburb of Babylon, with the, I don't know, the capital being Rome, is that this is something, for example, um, when I had to pick yeshivas for my children, I, you know, as, as you know, I lived for many years in Crown Heights. Mm-hmm. And I had to look through, I mean, we're not Lubavitch, but indicative of that fact. I'm like, who cares? There wasn't a yeshiva, A, that was co-ed, and B, every sing- single yeshiva currently standing in Crown Heights, correct me if I'm wrong, and I mean that, with the exception of lamplighters, has an allegation of sexual abuse somehow, somewhere attached to it in pertaining to the boys' school. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And um, it, it's it's not, it, you know, the, the issue is, the, the issue really isn't so much what to do about it. The issue is more that they don't view it for what it is. They, they, they don't view it for the damage that it causes. They view it as something you go through. You know, they, they view it as something that's, oh, it's unfortunate, you know, like all this happened. You're like, oh, man, like that sucks, you know, pray to God. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not viewed as, as an issue. You know, it's not, people don't just see it as, I mean, I mean, you, you see it everywhere. You know, there, there was a rabbi that was I don't know if you remember, he was convicted of like 65 counts of, of, of child abuse and stuff like that. And, and, you know, his whole posse, his whole, you know, all his followers, I don't remember his name exactly, but I do remember that he ended up getting about like 200 years in prison. But the crazy part is that his, all his followers came to, to get him out, you know? And, And if you think about it, you have, what, 100, 200 people coming to support someone that was just convicted of 65 counts of child abuse and they're coming to support him, you know? And, and, and so it's not viewed as an issue, you know? 65 counts of child abuse, whatever. It's not a big deal. No, let's um, be clear. This wasn't 65 counts of child abuse. This was 65 counts of criminal sexual misconduct towards yeah. children. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. Sex yeah. abuse. Yeah. Sex abuse. Yeah. And, and, um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's crazy to think about. And it's a really scary thing. It's a, it, it's a scary thing to realize that, that someone would follow someone so blindly because of a beard, you know, it, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, and, you know, and that's why I question things, you know, that's why I question certain things that happen. And I question, you know, the way people go about certain things. And, and, and it's, it's crazy to, to think that so many people would follow someone convicted of 65 counts of child, child sexual abuse. It's just, it, it just, I mean, I have no words for it. You know, it, it's right. not something, it's not something that can be explained. It's, it's it, all, all it is, it's, it's, it's blind faith. And that's what 
and that's what everything is run on. So, of course, when something like that happens, you know, tra- like when it's when it's sex abuse, it's oh well, it doesn't make a difference because you know this is my rally, and like you know he's good, so who cares? Well, um, we're seeing now that on the topic of who cares, and I think this is where we will finish and then pick back up next week, is we've seen that sexual abuse seems to go hand in hand with opiate abuse. We've seen that sexual abuse seems to go hand in hand with alcoholism, borderline personality disorder. I've had three therapists in my adult life ask me if my mother carries a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Now, my mother will, I mean, may she live and be well until 120. She will never get help. She will never talk to a trained professional about the hellacious things that happened to her. But there are things in her behaviors and her mannerisms where it's clear to me that this was not treated with the level of seriousness in which it damaged her because even in her interactions um and that this came out in my marriage also you know you don't know anything about x y and z because nobody ever did a b and c to you growing up and i heard that come out the mouth of my mother mm-hmm. and my husband And we're going to talk about those things that come up when a person has and has not had counseling. And you have been, you know, very um, proactive in trying to get well. And, um, you know, one of the scary parts for me that I'm thinking about right now is, you know, like we're we're on live right now, and and, and I mean I've, yeah, you know, and, and we're what like a half hour in or something like that, and you know, when when you've gone through something like that, there's there's this unspoken anxiety that's just it's always there. It's like this pending doom, this pending, you know, just scariness of like it happening again, or just the memories, or just the, the, the PTSD, or whatever it is, and I'm literally sitting here, and my, my phone is shaking, my hand is still shaking, even after speaking about it for a half hour, you know, that's, that's the, the degree of, of, of power that it takes over you, even after counseling, even after years and years of therapy, you know, I still, I still shake when I, you know, anytime, so it's, right. it's, um, yeah, it, it, it takes charge of your whole life. It takes charge of your brain. It takes charge of everything. Well, hopefully this will be one of many platforms in which this can be brought, the seriousness of this can be brought to light. And my whole point, my whole goal is to do, like, Well, I feel like, you know, picking up, closing out this and and where we'll pick up next time is Mm -hmm. when we are affected by somebody's story, their experiences, our own experiences, when this shakes the foundation of who we are, Mm -hmm. I feel like you feel this way or you react this way. It, It triggers that anger, that sadness, that something inside of you, you know, me, that if I feel this way, I can either sit with these feelings and essentially accomplish nothing, or I can do things like this and try to be, try to be a beacon of hope to people who are suffering, who are struggling, or people who are frankly naive and don't, still don't understand how serious sex, you know, childhood sexual assault really is. If it's yeah. something that's so big, you know, the rabbis told your parents, this isn't a big deal. Well, I wish the rabbit was Google around back then. Was Google <laughs> around? Could they Google it? 
I don't think so. I mean, well, probably. I don't remember. I, I don't know because you're so sheltered. You don't even know anything at that point. Right. But we're seeing, and I will post this in the bottom because I think this is really important, is that in brain scans, the victim scan looks different from the person who is not. And if you look at the brain scans of pedophiles, serial killers, you will see that their brains are not intact. And it makes me wonder what, what should we be doing? What can we do to correct this? Because at this point, we have to, we already know that sending pedophiles to prison, unless they're going there for the rest of their lives, we know that sending the pedophiles to prison does not stop them. Yeah. That much we know. And it's my hope that um, something can be done. A new punishment for them. Yeah. A treatment, something, anything. And before we can do that, I feel like the world needs to wake up. And most, I mean, listen, equally as important the world, but the piece of the world in which that we live in, in the Jewish community, needs to wake up and see that it is a um, that pedophilia is an evil that does not discriminate. Yeah. And um, next week we will pick up and get into you. The good, the bad, the ugly and the, uh, the bullshit in between, but hopefully the good parts and what we can do, what happened but maybe what should have happened yeah. to stop this so that it did not become a bigger problem. Um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody who tuned in and who commented. And um, for those of you who don't know who Baruch is, take a look at his page. He's a poet. He's an actor. He's a musician. He is so many things. He is a survivor. He's an inspiration. And, um, also, if anyone wants to go to jewishcommunitywatch.org, I say this, please, please, even, like, a lot of us don't have a lot of money, but even if you can afford $5 a month to give to JCW for what they do to prevent, to teach, to heal, um, not only the victims, but the abusers themselves, please do so. And um, check out the Wall of Shame, because it is a... Hard, hard day when you look at Jewish Community Watch's website and you realize there is somebody that you know personally. Um, in this particular equation, I had stayed at their house for five weeks when I was in England. Yeah. When it comes to sexual abuse, we never know because I lived under the roof with that man, his amazing wife, and beautiful children for five weeks when I was in England, and I never, ever would have thought he would be capable of something like this. And yeah. for crying out loud, I have to see a therapist for the psychically gifted. And if I could not live in, if I could live in that house for five weeks and come and go as I please, eat at their table every day, every, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. not pick up a ting. This guy's a predator. That means none of us can yeah. ever really know for sure. And we just have to let the evidence speak for itself. Anyway, we will see you next week where we will pick up where we left off. Uh, thank you. Thank everybody else. Awesome. And um, if, if I don't do another video, Shabbat Shalom. 